This is Greg, and he probably spends more time thinking about your power outlets than you ever have, or ever will. Microgeneration is the idea that people can make their own clean power, use what they need, and sell what they don't. As the director of development at an energy company, you might think this idea wouldn't be very appealing to Greg, but he sees it as an essential tool in the fight for energy resiliency. We sat down with Greg to discuss how we can use microgeneration to make communities more resilient while making the energy they use more sustainable, and what the energy system of tomorrow might look like, here on Renewable. What scares me a little bit is someone that looks at our like what we're doing to our energy system in Alberta. So we're shutting down all our coal. One of the, the impacts is you're going to have an electrical grid that completely is reliant on, on gas fire generation. Like it's going to be 80% gas, best case scenario. Because right now only about 10% of the grid is renewables. We may get to 20 in the next 10 or 15 years, but it's going to be slow. <sighs> And then what does the heat grid rely on? Gas. So if something happens to your gas supply in Alberta, what do you lose? Everything. Everything. If you want to understand microgeneration, you need to understand the power grid, the system that gets electricity from producers to consumers. You have generating stations that produce power, transmission lines that carry power from one place to another, substations that get it ready for delivery, and distribution lines that pipe it to individual consumers. But that delivery doesn't necessarily go one way. If a consumer generates their own power using solar, geo, or any renewable technology, they can use what they need and sell the rest back into the grid. Generating your own power? We call that microgeneration. But to understand the true potential of microgen, we need to look at how a building uses energy. So your, your typical home, probably about, if, if we took a, a pie and said, what percentage is used by what? You'd say about 60 to 70% of the energy used in that home is gonna be space heat. So that's, that's heat for heating the home and heating hot water. The rest will be electricity. In this building, the envelope is built to a much higher standard than code. So the building requires much less energy to heat it. The re result is the building has a 60 to 80% reduction in carbon emissions annually. On top of that, there are going to be utility savings to the homeowner. So the cost of living in that home, because you're using renewables when they're available, the cost is very low of that electricity and you're using less gas and less electricity because the home is so efficient. So it's just cheaper to live there and you can feel good about it. The result is that you can make massive changes in your carbon footprint in the building you choose to live in or work in. But what if you can't rely on the grid? What if, because of where you live, you don't always know that electricity will come out of that outlet? When I think of energy security, I ultimately think about the concept of resiliency. So if you lose one of those types of energy, so the power goes out for a few hours or even for a day because we had a big storm or something happened, um, you know, some sort of interruption on the grid, that you can still keep operating and keep the core things important to you, like heat, like running water, going during that interruption. If you look outside of the capital region and you go to smaller communities that are fed by one wire or sometimes even one small power plant, if something happens to that one wire or that one power plant, they're, they're, they're out of energy. They, they have no energy security in that case, or very little energy security. They may have some other form of backup. And so as we figure out these low carbon technologies, there's a real opportunity to add to people's energy security while we add to their environmental sustainability as well. Sustainability, resiliency, microgeneration doesn't fully answer any of these things. The grid can't stay dirty just because people can choose to make clean power. And we can't let people live without reliable access to power just because they could do microgeneration. Microgeneration is a way to make the systems we have stronger and cleaner, yes, but it doesn't fix them. We wrapped up with a discussion about 
what Greg thinks we can be doing to make this technology work better, and what we should be asking of our energy systems. What I think we do do is build buildings that A, if you lose the heat, like this building, if they lost their heat for a day, it doesn't matter. The building's so good. And they can keep the computers on and all that just from the solar most days, even without batteries. But with batteries, they could go for days here. So that's where, as a, you think of a hospital or a senior center, that's where we need to think of like, we want to keep, like, I would say in a hospital, you probably don't care that much about the carbon emissions from the hospital. You care that it's going to work when you're there. But we can do both and do it on scale and as a community increase our own resiliency, which ultimately will save lives, but also lower carbon, which ultimately will make the world a better place for everyone. And, and, and that's great that we can do both. And that's where people need to frame this a little bit, to see that it's not one or the other, we can do both.